to Breaking Ground. Before we get started, I just want to do a shout out to our sponsors really quick. Uh, thanks to the folks at uh, Versprite, Tenable, Amazon, Protivity, and Source of Knowledge for putting, uh, helping us put all this on uh, for the, the couple days. Uh, I do want to introduce our uh, speakers today. We have uh, Nir and Patrick, both from the NCR Corporation. Nir is the uh, head of application security uh, at NCR and Patrick's a application security architect uh, with NCR. And they will be talking to us today about uh, breaking the payment points of interaction. So, gentlemen, over to you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I know it's a tough hour after lunch, but uh, I can assure you that we're going to make it really interesting for you because uh, today we're talking about breaking payment points of interaction. And the main thing that we're going to do is um, break few things that you think they may be secure. So we have a bunch of demos. Uh, we'll steal credit cards in live environment here. So we really hope that, uh, that you're enjoying. So um, we'd like to make a quick introduction. The main challenge that we have with this introduction is that we want to talk a lot about, about ourselves. But we can't do that. We have really limited time. So we made an XML file that explains who we are. I don't know if you'll be able to read it, um, but we just uh, shortened it for you. So um, as I mentioned, like my name is Nir, and um, I'm heading the application security. Um, my motto is uh, if you think that security is expensive, just try to ignore it. I spoke at several conferences, and um, I'm an open source contributor. And I'm Patrick Watson. I'm an application security architect with NCR. And I am a first time speaker. So hooray for B-Sides and hooray for me. So thank you. Thank you very much. You're a gracious audience. Uh, and I've contributed to a few uh, open source projects, OpenSSL, CURL, but not that much. Mostly proprietary closed source stuff, you know, business things. Uh, I'm sort of the engineer, the software developer guy, so I like to brag about that a little bit. I develop a bit better than Nier. But let's move on, see what we're going to be talking about, our research. So part of our jobs at NCR is not only to make sure that our software is secure, but to make sure that the software in the ecosystem is secure. So we take a look at other people's software and the devices running at stores or banks or wherever as well. Part of that is sometimes we have to actually disable some of the security, alter our code so that we can figure out if our stuff is protecting everybody or if it's the protection built into, say, pin pads. So that's sort of what we did in this case. And lo and behold, a whole bunch of stuff came out that we really didn't want to know about. But now we do, so we kind of have to deal with it. Now, let's talk about the industry a little bit. NCR serves a bunch of stuff, but you don't really care about that. It's, we've got different aspects of the payment ecosystem. And they all do kind of the same things. But you've got retail doing it one way. Hospitality, that's uh, uh, hotels, uh, restaurants, that sort of place, and petroleum convenience stores, all doing things slightly different. Now, a couple years ago, you may have heard of a few very high profile breaches in the retail industry. Uh, almost everybody in the US was affected in one way or another. And because of that, retail has started paying a lot more attention to security. Now, what would you guys say if I told you that the problems of security in retail was, were solved, that people had figured it out and we're good now, we can, we can go home, right? <laughs> well, no, not really. That, that just <laughs> doesn't, no. Okay, so we have some background about the industries and uh, one, why we came here, but before you get it, the information about how to hack some stuff, I think that you should understand the architecture that we're trying to break. So there are several architecture types uh, that, uh, that I want to cover, especially three. 
that if you'll go to any retail store or um, you know, hospitality businesses, you'll probably see the same architecture with minor changes. So the first architecture is something called the segregated store architecture. It's essentially uh, an architecture that, that um, you have the point of sales in the store, you have a store server, and you have the pin pads. So the pin pads, the managed pin pads, are the ones that can connect to point of sales using ethernet cable or just serial cables. Um, in this specific architecture, you may have firewalls in the store, uh, which is great, and you have your pin pads. In some cases, you have the pin pads uh, segregated to specific VLAN in the store or a specific VLAN for the whole chain. Whatever it is, this is one attack vector. The other architecture that we're exploring is the all-in-one solution, uh, our, uh, the, the all-in-one store architecture, which means that you have the pin pad, as I mentioned, can be connected using serial cables. So when you see the malware attacks on pin pads or on point of sales, in most cases you see it in this architecture, meaning if you have any memory scraper that tries to get the credit card number from the memory, that's pretty much the architecture because you have the credit card number that is uh, uh, received from the serial port. So this is one thing about this architecture. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that when you have these memory scrapers on this point of sale, eventually you will figure this out. You will see that you have a malware there. The reason for that is because there is a weak hardware on most point of sales and memory scraping just takes CPU. So you will eventually see that. So when you scan an item, you won't hear the bip immediately after that. You will just probably hear it a little bit, uh, um, you know, a little bit after that. And the last architecture that I want to cover is fuel stations. When is the last time that you saw any fuel station getting hacked? Well, probably you didn't hear a lot about it. So with fuel station architecture, it's even less secure than what you know or what you heard now. With fuel architecture, you actually have the fuel pump, which has a pin pad, and the fuel pump is connected to a kind of a, a layer two adapter. The layer two adapter gets kind of a two cables connected to it. It's a proprietary protocol, and the layer two adapter, which in most cases, nothing is authenticated to that, then it speaks with the payment application. So that's pretty much was the, the architecture. But let's talk for a moment about the payment flow, because that's what we're going to exploit in this talk. So a typical payment flow, let's say that we're getting into a store and uh, you're starting to scan the items. You scan the items and eventually you need to check out. So the cashier press on the pay, uh, on the pay button. The pay button eventually brings you to the payment application. The payment application, um, as I mentioned, can be a DLL, it can be a server that gets this request, and, um, and eventually the payment application controls the pin pad, the point of interaction. It says the point of interaction what to do and what to get from the consumer. So the first thing that the payment application will ask will be the credit card data, which may be uh, track one, two data. For those who don't know what track one, two means, that's the, uh, the, the data that is written on the magnetic stripe of your card. It can be that or EMV tags in case using a chip and pin technology. So once you get it, if you're using a chip and pin technology or generally you need to, to enter a pin, then again, the, point of inter the payment application requests from the point of interaction to get the pin, receives it back, and um, in online scenarios, it will just submit the request to the, to the host in order to process the, the payment. In other cases, if the host is not available, it will just store the transaction, in most cases in an encrypted manner, in the payment application. Eventually, the transaction ends when you get the authorization code and you're checking out. So let's start talking about the interesting stuff. Because now I just thought that you know after lunch, that's a good time to give you the background. You can get asleep. Now that's the time to get awake. So um, with the authentication to point of interactions, the first thing that I want to show you is um, the layer two adapter. 
Somehow we managed to get a photo of it. Believe me, we have access to some stuff. And, um, and this is an L2 adapter and the cable called um, a current loop. So eventually, if you're able to tap that, you will be able to see all requests in clear text and do pretty much whatever you want, including sending your own requests to the L2 adapter because there is no authentication there. Having said that, there is a compensated control because these cables are just under concrete in the fuel stations. So you won't be able to see these adapters unless someone just uh, made a bug, a small mistake in the design. So our scenario is focuses mainly on something that called stream software. The main idea is to put a man in the middle between the payment application and the point of interaction. We don't care about the point of sale. We don't care how much secure the point of sale is. All we care about is how to tap the connection between these two components. So by tapping the, the connection between the, these components, we can do it by um, you know, Wireshark with TCP IP. We can do it with serial port monitoring that we can just check what's going on um, back and forth. And obviously, we can just um, use it as a binary. So when I mention binary, it's not a malware. Binary means that you take the payment application DLL, make your own changes to this DLL, and just replace it. So essentially, it's not a malware, and it will not be identified anywhere. It will not affect the performance because no one reads the damn memory. No one cares about it. We just care about getting the credit card number from the same DLL that handles it. That handles it. So, so take it away, Pat. Yes. So the first thing we're going to tell you about is just sort of what we've got up here, because you guys can't see it, you know, especially those of you in the back. We've got my laptop. This is running a point of sale simulator and one of our payment applications. The, like I mentioned early, the, or that payment application has been modified, so some of its own proprietary security stuff is disabled. That way, we, we concentrate on the security of the pin pad. Pause simulator is just something we use internally to, so that we don't have to lug a giant point of sale around. Got a switch. We've got a Raspberry Pi 3 here, which is running our attack code, the, the man in the middle part. The Raspberry Pi 3, frankly, is a little bit of overkill for this, but it's oh. fun to have hardware, so, you know. Apparently having a little bit of technical difficulty with the display. That will be fine. Finally, we've got a pin pad here. The Hello, audience. <laughs> we've got a what we call a shroud of secrecy over the pin pad because we didn't want to specifically call out this vendor. There's a lot of pin pad vendors out there, a lot of different models, and this isn't a vulnerability in a single pin pad. It's sort of a problem in the way the system works. So now let's go to the demo. And I believe with this one, we're just swiping a card and seeing if we can see the track data, see what that looks like. While Patrick does it, uh, it's important to mention that we're running a production image on yes. this pin pad. So it's not that we disabled some functionality on the pin pad itself. It just, that's the way it works in production when you pay. Yeah, you could probably go and find this in a real store somewhere today. Uh, they probably would have prettied up the graphics on the pin pad screen a little bit, but that's the only difference. So let's start a transaction. Uh, this time, let's just put a deli item on there. And if you note, it says, please swipe your card. So I'm going to go ahead and do what's called a swipe ahead transaction. A uh, little tricky to get the card in there with the privacy screen in place. But. So swipe ahead is where you swipe the card before the transaction is complete. The reason I'm doing that this time is because when you're doing a swipe ahead transaction, you can actually easily see track one and two, both of them, versus with this an EMV enabled pin pad. When you complete the transaction, it goes into EMV mode, and then you can really only see track two. I'll show you a little bit about that later. But get this in the slot. Hmm. Oh, 
let's just do a sale. It's a live demo. So you'll need to understand that uh, so this we're is, swiping real data here. <laughs> this is the EMB screen I was talking about earlier. There we go. All right, so now it's swiped, and if you look over there at the Raspberry Pi, we've captured the entire track data. Let's complete out the sale, sign things. There we go. And Nir, if you could bring up Wireshark for me. So let's adjust this. Nir, where's the uh, thingy? Well, we need to enlarge it again. Ah, all right. So here you can see that the pin pad makes a request to the man in the middle, man in the middle requests to the pause simulator, so it's passing the data through. So let's scroll over here to the right, and here is that same track data in plain text that you saw up here on the Raspberry Pi. So from the track data perspective, pretty darn easy to capture this stuff. Okay, that was easy, except the swiping stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, the thing is that you saw, in our case, that it's not encrypted. In fact, in most cases, it's not encrypted. The reason for that, or at least in, you know, in, in uh, network communications, is, first of all, the point of sales running legacy operating system, sometimes Windows XP, um, and sometimes the pin pads are pretty old, but that's not an excuse, this is just a fact. One time I remember that we requested um, you know, to enable TLS 1.2 on one of the pin pads, and they said, like, why? We can give you SSL 3, is that good <laughs> enough? So that's the business justification, eventually, you know, we want them to secure it, but eventually hackers have also their own justifications. So that was talking about Ethernet man in the middle, a passive man in the middle, which, you know, everybody knows how to capture packets in Wireshark. Ooh, whoop de doo right? So you might think to yourself, well, what about those pin pads connected via serial ports? They're probably a little more secure, right? Because it's not an Ethernet cable. You can't intercept those things, right? Well, no, not really. And because it's a pain to carry around a bunch of pin pads and you definitely can't switch them in the middle of a presentation, we've got a video here capturing us swiping the data while it's connected via a serial port. This is some software from Eltma software called Serial Port Monitor that's very useful for this sort of thing. And you might not be able to see it on the screen there, so we've got a, another slide here that's blown up. And if you recognize it, this would have been the exact same packet that you saw if we had done the swipe ahead. However, you get the same stuff when you do the EMV transaction as well. Point is, you can see track one up there starting with the B and track two further down. So not only can you capture serial port data, and if serial port monitor can do it, malware or a replaced DLL can do it too. So that was swiping. How many of you are really swiping today? Let's talk about EMV. That's probably secure. Ha, it's a good one. So let's talk about what EMV does first. EMV does prevent a duplication of the card because it has the chip on the card. So this is one thing. The other thing is, in case you want to use a stolen card, it prevents you to use it when you use the chip and pin. Like you don't know the pin, so you shouldn't be able to using it. That's all. Let's talk about what it does not do. Let's say that someone stole my track data from the card. So first of all, or let's say even someone stole my card, that's it. First of all, he can use this card on pin pads that are not chip and pin enabled. 
So if, one, if someone steals my chip and pin card, he can use it in other places, on e-commerce, on like no, old pin pads, or even in manual card entry. How many times it happens to you that you scan the card and you just can't read it? Well, it just happened here, but, um, but eventually that, that's a real scenario. The other scenario is actually um, the fact that you can take the track two data from the pin pad, and you will need to change only one number in this track in order to make it a uh, non-chippable or swipe card. The thing is that um, when you swipe the card, the, ch the pin pad knows to identify if it's a chip and pin card. It's not that it reads the card. It's not that it reads the chip. It just sees the number that says, this is, one moment, this is the, the type of the card. And the last thing is, um, even if you steal the card or steal the track data, you can come with a card with an image of a chip or a broken chip, it doesn't matter. When you come to the cashier and you try to stick your chip and pin card to the pin pad, and you know, sometimes it just doesn't work. So the cashier can manually fall back to swipe. That's the idea. So EMV, it's quite old standard. Should we be able to bypass it if it's like really old standard? Probably. So we have three man in the middle scenarios in this talk. The first man in the middle scenario is kind of a passive man in the middle. The passive man in the middle is relatively simple. The main idea is to get the EMV data and see if we can see the track data and actually create a credit card from EMV transaction. So the main idea is, first of all, inject your man in the middle uh, stuff. It can be you know, the DLL or just intercepting the communication. So we have the adversary on the left side and we have the rest as we already had in the regular payment process. So the main idea is that you're doing your selling activities, obviously you finish, then you ask from the payment application to pay. The payment application will get a credit card number or request a credit card number from the pin pad, which eventually will go to the adversary and from there to the, uh, to the pin pad. And then once the consumer sticks the data, sticks the card, we will actually be able to see the full track data. Demo in a moment. Once we see the data, you can continue with the whole process, including getting the chip, and you finish. So I think that the best thing to show you is just hand it over to Patrick. Yeah. So, Nir, if you would please set up the camera for us. Uh, so, we're, like Nir said, we're going to run a regular EMV transaction this time, just to see if we can capture the, the EMV data and see what it looks like. So, let's start a transaction, put a deli item on here, just because we like delis. Start a sale. It should prompt for us to insert our card. We've got a standard UL test card here. Insert it into the slot. It's going to prompt me to accept the transaction amount. And if you look over there near, it should have the track data on the Raspberry Pi at this point. You can take a photo of it, but you can't use it. It's a test card. It's a test card. OK, so I don't know that all of you taking photos of it, it won't work. Yeah. And that explanation took long enough that the pin pad timed out now. now so that you guys can get a good view of this, let's start that over again. In the transaction, start it back up. Daily item, sale. Give it a minute, insert. Accept the transaction amount. Now, type in our PIN, which is 4315, by the way. Never tell anybody your PIN, but since it's a test card, that's okay. Press enter, and I must have mistyped it. It's a live demo. Five. There we go. Typed it right that time. So approved. Remove the card. 
and the transaction should process. There we go. All right. So now, Nir, if you please, could you switch to the next slide for us? All right. So just so that we don't have to uh, go through Wireshark every time and find the packets and all that, we pre-captured this for you. This is what the EMV response packet looks like to the request to get track data, essentially. So you can see some stuff over there on the right, and I'm just going to tell you that where it says American Express, that's called an AID, that's the application identifier, which type of card it is. Below that it says EIPS, blah, blah, blah. That's the card holder name in this case because it's a test card, it's kind of weird looking. Now, does anybody in here see track data in there? Near does. I, I made a deck. Yeah. So we know where it is. Good. We've got one person. Yep. Now, anybody else? Nope, not yet. So in most payment applications, uh, it often is transferred via ASCII, so you actually see ASCII card numbers, like you know, the standard one, two, three, four, blah, blah, blah. But EMV actually sticks it over in kind of a weird format where they take the, the actual text representation, chan, change the binary bytes into that representation so it shows up that way in, when you're looking at, looking at it in hex. Now, that means that we've got the whole track there available for us from an EMV transaction. Now, if you look down here at the bottom of the screen, you can see that we've got it in a couple different colors. The red is obviously the card number. The purple next to it, the 1903, is the expiration date. Then in kind of a orange that doesn't display all that great is 201. And I'll get to that, what that is in a second. And then a whole bunch of discretionary data that depends on what type of card it is. That 201 is called a service code. And the two is a very, very important part of that code because that is what lets you know if it's a swipe card or a chip card. So when you just swipe it, that two tells the pin pad, this is a chip card, don't allow the swipe. So in the tax scenarios Nier was talking about earlier, if you're offline and not being verified by a host, you can switch that two to a one and your pin pad will accept the transaction. So that's great, you know. We found a way to get the credit card data. Great. But we're still, meeting, we're still missing some data. We still want to get more data to be able purchasing online, for instance. So when you purchase online, what do you really need to enter? Exactly. Oh, exactly. So CVV2 is exactly what you need to enter. The CVV2 is, um, you know, it's something that came with one of, one of the brands, but basically it's the three or four digit number that you have in the back of your card. Or with Amex, you have the four digits in the front of your card. That allows you to perform card not present transactions, meaning online transactions. And, um, and we want to check if we will be able to get the CVV2 here with this flow. So we found a way. Surprising. Let's talk about the active man in the middle attacks. So the first active man in the middle attack is the one that compromises the CVV data. We have the same flow, again, doing the payments, asking for the, uh, the cardholder data, the, the EMV tags are sent back to the adversary, which we already know that we can get the data from there. And then the, the most important part here is to understand the timing. So we, the adversary gets the EMV tags back. The adversary will not send the EMV tags back to the payment application until he gets more data because eventually we want to make sure that we uh, successfully finish the transaction. From that reason, the adversary sends another API call to the pin pad 
the API call will just request the CVV data that it's, it's a built-in functionality within the pin pads. So we don't need to exploit anything. We just need to have additional API call. It's nothing, essentially. We're not exploiting anything. We're just playing with the flows. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at it. Cameraman, if you will. So once Nier gets that set up, we'll go ahead and start the transaction. But while he sets it up, an important thing to know about CVV2 and the equivalents from other merchant or card brands is in theory, the CVV helps protect online transactions because it's never encoded anywhere in the actual data on like the mag stripe or the chip. So that's why it's on the back of the card. So let's start a transaction. Let's put two deli items on there this time. We'll, fe we'll feel daring. Start the sale. Should prompt for entry. There it goes. Insert the chip card. And at this point, we've already got the track data over there in the Raspberry Pi. Now we'll accept the transaction amount. It'll prompt me for my PIN, 4315, and hopefully I typed it correctly. Looks like I did. And look at this, a new prompt that wasn't there before. And this is, since this is a test card, it doesn't actually have a real CVV2, so I'm just going to make one up. Anybody got a suggestion? Need three or four? One, two, three, four? Type that in, processes for a minute, the Raspberry Pi picks it up, and the pin pad approves. Payment application is none the wiser. Okay, so that was good enough to get online payments. Anyone needs a yacht, something? Um, but the thing is that we want to get more information. What happened if we could get the PIN? Well, we can. That's the idea. So in this flow, um, we're actually doing pretty much the same thing. But in this case, we won't stop in the... Um, in the EMV tags. So let's assume that we finished to get the, the EMV tags. Now the payment application requests for PIN, which by the way we avoided in the previous flow, but we had it in the demo. So you request the PIN, or the payment application requests the PIN, the encrypted PIN from the point of interaction. The point of interaction responds with the PIN to the adversary, and then the adversary does it again. Before responding with the encrypted PIN to the uh, payment application, it actually requests a numeric screen. The numeric screen will eventually ask to re-enter the PIN. When it will request to re-enter the PIN, it will be our screen, something that we injected into this process. And then we'll get the PIN. So let's get a few pins. Yep. And for time's sake, I'm going to go ahead and start the transaction, put oh. a couple items on here. And once Nier gets the camera ready. So we've got the couple items on the screen. Click sale, so it'll prompt for the card entry. If I can find the slot. There it is. Now, we've got the track data on the Raspberry Pi, except the transaction amount. Now, here's the real pin entry screen like you've been seeing before, 4315, push enter. And here's a new screen. This one's kind of important, though. Now, if I was at a place, I'd know, hey, this, I, I shouldn't be prompted for this, but it's a pin pad. What, it, you're all security professionals. Maybe you'll catch it, maybe you won't. But check out the Raspberry Pi. It's got the PIN number now. And 
Joe from the, a farm down the street, not to impinge on farmers, but a, a layman isn't going to know the pin pad shouldn't be doing this. And in our informal testing, even in the payments industry, 90% of the people weren't even suspicious of it. They just entered their pin anyway. The ones that were suspicious still thought, well, maybe I mistyped it. It's kind of weird that security guys are having me do this demo and whatever, and they typed it in anyway. Did you hear the question? Yes. I prefer to keep the questions to the end because we have a few more things to cover. Okay? And quickly running out of time. Yes. We'll get to you though. So let's say that we've got the pin and uh, we've got the CVV. These were great demos, but in fact, um, you know, several uh, point, of, point of interaction manufacturers, they actually put some security. Uh, uh, measures in these pen, is in these pin pads. So one of the security measures is do not allow any text except the text that I allowed in this long list. Guess what? This long list includes please re-enter. So when you have the screen of enter pin and then you re and then you request to re-enter, it refers to the pin. It's not re-enter your address. address, which is quite difficult to enter so, your yeah. address there. So that's pretty much what we're exploiting. So let's say that we bypassed the whitelist and, uh, and succeeded with that. That's great. But in some cases, uh, we can't bypass the whitelist because the whitelist is so strict. So that's it? We ended up with it? Not exactly. Several manufacturers actually allow you to inject a form or a screen to the software. The reason for that is because, as Patrick mentioned at the beginning of the talk, in the, re uh, in the hospitality and petroleum, petroleum and convenience stores, they have uh, their, their own flows. And the pin pad manufacturers cannot come up with all of the flows. In retail, it's pretty, more, pretty much standard, but that's what we're we can do because it's just something available. So in order to bypass the whitelist, we can actually put a photo with please enter pin. That's it. And obviously add the, uh, the control to get the card number. So I guess that in order to, um, for us to believe us, we did it too. So. Um, so Patrick will demonstrate in a moment. One thing that's worth mentioning is that several manufacturers actually have protection against it. They request or require a signed form that is signed by the vendor or by, the, by themselves. So let's see how it works. So normally when an attacker is injecting forms like this, it would happen pretty quick, so we're going to actually slow down a little bit so you can see what's happening. A smart w attacker would also do this part like at midnight or whenever, sometime where the store's not actually open. However, with some pin pad models, it is possible to do it mid-transaction, although it'd be kind of crazy. So I'm about to inject a form into the pin pad. You should see a downloading screen, and it'll pause there. Click OK, give it a second, there it goes. Now, if you saw the progress bar go across there really, really fast, once it reached the end, that's when a normal pin pad would have went right back to the welcome screen. This obviously is paused here so you can see it, but this is what would have flashed almost instantaneously in a real attack. Now, let's go back and start a transaction. Start transaction. Let's put a deli item in a grocery item this time. Click sale. We'll prompt for card entry. Accept the amount. As usual, we've got the track data over there. Enter the PIN. 
four three one five. And now we've got our own uh, uh, custom screen. Now, obviously nobody's really going to enter their pin in this screen, but the point is so that you know that it's a, a form from us, a screen from us. It's not, a, a, it did come from the pin pad vendor, we'll say that. Put in all ones. Maybe it's cool if it comes from the vendor. Well, I don't know if I want my face on every transaction out there, but to each their own. So remove the card, take a look at the pie. We've got the pin again. And there we go. Now, thank you, thank you. So we've talked about a bunch of stuff here, but what other attack vectors are there? And I'm going to breeze through this because we're short on time a little bit. You've probably heard about skimmers before. They're still a problem. Uh, we get reports about them happening all the time. Some of them are incredibly clever too. Like I wouldn't be able to identify them myself if they were sitting right here in front of me. Point is, those are kind of a known thing. Next is, remember this diagram from before? We've got the pin pad over there too now. And We've only really been taking a look at one application on that pin pad. But remember, like most Internet of Things type devices, this is really a computer. It's running all kinds of code on there. There's an OS, there's a secure reading and entry device that's kind of like a TPM, and a whole bunch of other applications. For example, what if there's a buffer overflow in the form loading app? It's accepting input for just, from just anybody there. So maybe there are other places we can look for attacks as well. So I'll review quickly the mitigations that may be taken by the vendors or um, like point of interaction vendors mainly. Um, so the idea is to have a point upon encryption. The point upon encryption should be hardware based and uh, with the pin pad vendors, they have a few options to encrypt the data in the hardware. They can use it like in regular memory or they can put it in a separate memory, which is a secure memory. Um, the, new van the new pin pads, um, the majority of them at least, support the SRAD functionality, which means separate component, some separate hardware component that no sensitive data goes out from there. The thing is that this pin pad also supports the same functionality. We just didn't enable it to do the SRED stuff. Um, important to mention that the pin pad vendors, they invest a lot in crypto. Like it's essentially a crypto product. It's a hardware crypto product. And, um, and the idea is to use um, strong enough algorithms. So even though you see here triple DES, which you may think, why the hell do you have triple DES on a pin pad? Well, actually it's a triple DES duck butt it means that for every transaction, you have your different key that you encrypt with the transaction uh, itself. Next thing is um, obviously preventing remote firmware downgrades. Like, let's say that we have a hardware encryption on the pin pad. We just want to prevent downgrading it to a software encryption like we had this time. Um, if there is a whitelist, in some cases, you can add your own whitelisted components. Um, in this case, you'll probably need to have your trusted uh, root authority that at least accepted on a pin pad. And uh, in some cases, you also have exceptions of credit card numbers. So everything is encrypted except specific bin ranges. It's a common thing for loyalty memberships. And last but not least is um, encrypt offline transactions. As I mentioned in the first place, in most cases, if you won't be able to get out to the host, to the processing host, you'll need to encrypt the data um, at rest. So let's say that the point of interaction doesn't support it. We don't have point of point encryption. Does it mean that we screwed? Probably not. You can request from the vendors to try to TLS it or at least SSL it with your certificates or uh, just sign all requests to the point of interaction. In several cases, you will be surprised that they can do that for you. And um, as for the consumers, well, 
except paying with cash, um, I think you can actually do a few things. One of them is do not re-enter PIN, like ever. OK, you saw what we can do. Check what the forms prompt to you in general. Because sometimes they may request social security numbers, and it's something that is acceptable by, um, you know, by these pin pads. And the last thing is try to use alternative methods to pay, like um, you know, app-based payments. Um, I'm paying with my watch. Um, in that case, no one can prompt me to re-enter my pin or to get my CVV data. Well, theoretically, they may be able to do that, but it's just worth additional research. We're just skipping some stuff to the next year of B-sides. So in summary, um, it's relatively easy to exploit point of interactions just because of the regular flow that we have there. And um, we can secure the point of interactions. It's just a matter of um, knowing what to ask from the vendors. And that's the time for I don't think we have enough question, enough time for questions, but we can at least address we, the fellow earlier. We actually have time for maybe one or two questions. So, so first, gentlemen. talking to the guy that mentioned earlier about CVV2, remember when you're doing an EMV transaction, if your card's in the slot and you pull the card out, it'll cancel the transaction. I think that's what he's probably referring to because you need to look at the back of the card for the CVV2. But because this is an active man in the middle and it can prompt whatever it wants, it can do it whenever it wants. So it can prompt for that before you actually swipe your card. The average consumer may not even realize that it's not supposed to be happening. So there you go. Hold on, hold on. Hi, uh, Lucian Constantin, ITG News Service. I wanted to ask when you mentioned uh, about uh, prompting CVV data, you, you, may, you said that it sends an AP call and this is built-in functionality. Is this particularly for the CVV, or were you talking about inserting a screen in general? Because if it's about the CVV, why why is this functionality there? Doesn't so. Well, go ahead. It's actually kind of both. So the question was when we were asking for CVV two, and we said that was a built-in API call, call. Were we talking about the prompt itself, or specifically CVV two? So what's actually going on there is we use a a screen or form or input method, whatever you want to call it, called get numeric, and that it allows you to provide a set of text to prompt with. So we can just ask for basically whatever we want there. It's customizable. It's yes. customizable, yes. What Nier had mentioned at par in part of the talk was there is, in some pin pads, a whitelist of allowable prompts. Inner CVV2 is one of those allowed prompts. In some cases, you just need to, uh, to perform a card not present transaction. Uh, so it's just one of the acceptable flows across the industry. OK. One more question. One more question. Thank you very, for, thank you very much for the demos. Awesome. Uh, if the bank issuer uh, of the card and the acquire and the terminal implement full EMV, all these demos you just saw, showed are protected? This is full EMV. All of them full EMV? This is full yes. EMV, yes. Yes. OK. OK, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, round of applause, please. Thank you.